All right, so I hope you enjoyed the previous session. I certainly did. Thank you so much, Bill, for, for this excellent uh, talk and uh, activities. Uh, so we're moving on. The next uh, talk is from the director of the uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation Institute of Public Understanding of Risk, our host. Uh, and uh, it will be around communicating risk to the public, which is equally important. It's one of you, uh, we consider all of you as uh, advocates for the uh, foundation so this is a big part of the role you need to be uh, aware of how through your work you could uh, disseminate uh, uh, basically you can disseminate what you're doing and how you're contributing into making a safer uh, safer place so communicating the risk to the public is also equally important and we very much look forward in hearing from professor Koch. Okay, very good morning to all of you. All right, yesterday I forgot to do something. Uh, I should do it now, it's not too late. Uh, let me welcome you to Singapore. I understand many of you, right? For many of you, this is your first time to Singapore. So I hope you enjoy your stay in Singapore and in NUS. Uh, I understand some of you come from as far as uh, North America and Europe, and some are from our neighbors nearby, Malaysia. Okay, I can recognize you. <laughs> Yeah, welcome. Uh, welcome to Singapore and welcome to NUS. Uh, so in the remaining one hour or so, we are going to before lunch, right? We are going to do three things. The first thing we need your uh, cooperation and participation. We are going to do an online survey. Okay, this online survey will take maybe ten minutes or a little bit more. Uh, to uh, for us, right? It's more for us to gauge the the, the concerns in, in terms of you know, what you think are risky stuff. Uh, what do you? What are the opinions about various kind of risk? Okay, so we do that first. Then I will talk about uh, public communication, uh, communication to risk communication to public. And I also invited my colleague, uh, Professor Bala, at the back later on. You're going to see him. Yeah, he is. Uh, his research in is in environmental engineering. So he his research also involved the use of uh, nano particles, you know, uh, nano materials. So he's going to share with us. Uh, in his perspective and based on his research experience, uh, how do you manage uh, this kind of risk? Okay, so that will complement my research because my talk will be very general, uh, the risk communication in general for all kinds of risk. Okay, so let's do the first thing first. Uh, so we need a cooperation. You need to go to this website. Yeah, uh, so if you have a handphone or a computer with you, uh, just, uh, uh, or you can use QR code, right? Uh, you can go to this website and then uh, you can start a survey. Okay, some are multiple choices, some are just filling the blank. Uh, and this data will be very useful for us because we are collaborating with Gallup, uh, which is a, a you know, world organization for polls. Okay, so some of this will correlate with our studies uh, in collaboration with Gallup. And, also, and some questions will actually help us to prepare for the next set of questions uh, that will be used uh, next year. Yep, uh, so maybe. Just about 10 minutes. Okay, are you, if you have any problem with uh, assessing the data, uh, this uh, website, just let us know. Just raise your hand. Okay. So you should see something like this. Uh, sorry, I, I, let me get another PowerPoint. Okay, so I can relax for 10 minutes. So, um, I guess most of you have finished. Yep. Uh, I think we will start. Uh. So, okay, thank you. Thank you for your participation. Okay, so I shall begin. Right, uh, I, I put down here uh, the, the title I have uh, so that you know that I'm actually a civil engineer. Okay, so my background is very different from what you guys are doing. Uh, and in terms of scale, you're talking about nano scale, nanometers. For civil engineers, we talk about kilometers of roads, uh, highways, uh, bridges, and so forth. Uh, so it's completely different scale. But I did have some uh, uh, past research experience on very small scale. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into that. So I, I do understand a little bit on the nano scale stuff. And also as a vaccine research before, so I get to read proposal on nano skills. But today my uh, 
uh, topic on this uh, risk communication, communication to the public is more general. In fact, you'll see uh, more examples related to uh, natural disasters because I happen to be the director for Centers for Hazard Research. But later on, my colleague, uh, as I already introduced, Professor Bala, will compliment in my, uh, the, my talk uh, by sharing his research in the nanoparticles and uh, nanotechnology. Okay, we have done the per uh, perception survey. Now, let's start with this. What is risk? Right. If you Google it, there are many, many definitions. So these are some of the definitions uh, according to dictionary and uh, you know World Economic Forums. Uh, I'm not going to go, to go through that, but basically it's something bad. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, risk normally refer to something unpleasant or something that can cause harm or danger to us. Right. Uh, and ISO uh, now thirty one thousand on the guidelines for risk management actually has a very simple definition. It is simply defined as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So there are three components, uh, basic components. One is uh, uncertainty. Uh, so it has to be something uncertain. We are not very sure. Uh, we don't know what's the probability of uh, that happening to us. Okay. Uh, without uncertainty, we don't call it a risk. It's well defined. You know, we, we, we probably can uh, just uh, do something about it. But when there's unknown or uncertainty, then that makes it more difficult to, to take action. Now, there's also the component of consequence. It must have some consequence, right? Uh, so if there's no consequence, you probably can ignore uh, whatever danger or harm that may cause to something else, okay? Maybe not me, maybe to another group of people or maybe to another planet. So it has to be a consequence on us. Then we start to worry about it. And there'll be exposure, right? Exposure actually related to the objective. Objective meaning that uh, you know, it may harm our body, you know, our health, or it may disrupt my life, you know, uh, affect my, my living style, or, or disrupt my projects. Right? Maybe I'm handling a project and there are some unknown elements there. So all these uncertainties are going to disrupt or maybe even uh, 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 destroy what I want to do. Okay, so just bear that uh, the uncertainty is something that you cannot quantify in the deterministic way. So normally we use probability, right? So we we'll talk about now, what's the chance or is the likelihood of happening in terms of probability? But that is where the problem begins. Yeah. So I will have some examples on that. Uh, so it's important okay, uh, to be able to communicate all these risks and uncertainties in the best possible way so that you can maximize the effect that you want to achieve. And uh, when we talk about risk communication, it is different from any other public relation or PR communication, right? Uh, so you're trying to provide useful information so that people can make uh, sound decisions. And uh, this useful information has to be fact-based, has to be evidence-based, right? Uh, unlike some PR talks, some PR talks sometimes will tend to ignore or only tell half-truth. Okay, so for risk communication, you want to be truthful. If you don't, you will, uh, when people start to realize that you're not telling the, the full truth or, or try to... Uh, cover up some truth, then they will lose uh, yeah, trust in you. So you lose the credibility. Then the risk communication actually will backfire on you. Okay. So, but on the other hand, you should also not just talk about risk. Right. Everything comes with risk. Actually, has benefits. So it's a balance. How do you weigh uh, benefits versus risk? Okay. So, uh, if the risk communication just focus on the uh, risk part, you may miss out something good. Okay because people have to make choices based on weighing uh, uh, risks against the benefits that they can uh, 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 get you know, from certain decisions. So it's really the benefits versus risk and decision. And uh, in, in terms of research, risk communication is still uh, at a formative stage, especially in Asia, right? Uh, so that's why we have this institute based in Singapore. Uh, our focus will be in Asia. Uh, uh, so there's much less research done on risk communication in Asia compared to the West. And uh, this is important because uh, risk communication also has this component of cultural context. Right? Different cultures, different countries, different ethnic groups will react to the risk differently, uh, will react to the messages differently. Even the choice of word you use may differ. Okay, uh, The effect of the choice of word may differ from one uh, culture to another culture. 
right? And this will obviously involve many other disciplines. It's not just engineering and science, okay? Engineering and science are very important, right? You need to be able to understand what actually the risk is, uh, like you heard this morning, uh, what are the potential risks of uh, using uh, nanoparticles, right? Uh, so those are important, but you need people from, uh, experts from psychology, uh, communications, decision science and behavior science and so forth, sociology, uh, because as I mentioned, there's also a cultural dimension. So all these different groups have to come in. So it's really a multidisciplinary research, uh, which makes the kind of research more challenging. I think some of you probably know, and if you try to do cross-disciplinary research, it's usually very difficult because you have to find common language and uh, common ground to, to be able to achieve the kind of uh, outcome you want. So what are needed in risk communication? Right, first you must get the numbers right, uh, facts right. All right. So if you want to be to tell somebody about certain kind of risk associated with some event or some use of some certain materials, then you better do your homework first, right? You must get the numbers right. Tell them the numbers, but how do you tell the numbers are very important. Okay, I will have some examples to show that. Right, you must tell the numbers uh, in some uh, uh, me uh, method that ordinary people, right, uh, the common public members will be able to appreciate, okay, and where applicable, you should compare uh, the risk that you are talking about with other similar risks, okay, because they may be able to already, uh, they may already accept risks associated with other things like car accidents, okay, uh, so if you can show that actually the risk of this thing is less than car accidents, then people will start to say, yeah, I'm already uh, accepting that kind of uh, risk using vehicles, using cars. Okay, so now by comparison, this is actually a lesser risk. And then of course, you should look at the benefits. Uh, uh. The reason we travel in cars, because there's a benefit, right? You can get to the destination faster, okay, than walking or cycling, right? So it's again back to the benefits versus risk. And so you got to show them that you no, know, there are some benefits to it. You no, know? so some good deal for you for for the users. And then of course the psychology, the emotion comes in, right? So you must tell them, you must treat them nice. You must gain their trust. Okay, you must make them partners rather than uh, you trying to, you know, uh, be the author uh, like authority to tell them what uh, what you understand is wrong and I'm right. You no, know? so the kind of uh, emotional aspect, the feeling aspect is very important in risk communication. So essentially, you have to do all of this right, okay? So you, it's not just numbers, it's not just effects. And one example is this, in fact, somebody did a study, right? Uh, so they have this uh, hypothetical case, a patient uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, evaluated uh, for discharge from a mental hospital, okay, after some treatment. And the psychiatrist has two options uh, to write this uh, assessment. Okay, A, right, patients similar to Mr. Jones, I mean, uh, this patient, are estimated to have a 20% probability of uh, committing an act of violence, okay, to others, right? Uh, so that is one way to put it. Or, of every 100 patients similar to Mr. Jones, 20 are estimated to commit an act of violence to others. So, we all know that in mathematics, Okay, 20% and 20 out of 100 are identical. They are the exact, exactly the same thing. But to an ordinary people, right, they may interpret differently. Uh, so let's say you are the supervisor or you, you are some, somebody who can uh, recommend whether Mr. Chun should be discharged from the hospital. So that question was posed to a group of people uh, under the survey and the outcome is different. Right, so this shows uh, uh, the percentage of people who do not, right, do not, uh, who recommend not to discharge. Okay, so they say do not discharge. So when they hear 20% probability, sorry, they, uh, about 21% say do not discharge. But when you give the assessment in the second way, right, out of every uh, 100 patients like Mr. Jones, 20 are going to probably uh, commit some kind of violent act, then the number goes up, uh, uh, actually double, 41% uh, will say do not discharge because then they say, hey, Mr. Jung could be one of the 20, okay? 
But when you say it's 21, uh, 20%, then they say, oh, uh, the 80% chance uh, he's okay. Uh, so you can see that even the same number, 20% or 20 or 100, supposed to mean the same mathematically, the effect uh, in, in the communication is different. Another example is this 100-year uh, event. Okay, sometimes we talk about natural disaster like flood. Okay, we use a return period uh, because we say that uh, you know this is very rare, right? It probably occurs once in every uh, 100 years. So this happened to a German town, right? In uh, 2002, okay, and it was a very bad flood, no? Uh, no? Uh, caused, it caused a lot of uh, damages and so forth, and it was consider a 100 year event uh, so they call it the 100 year flood or century flood you know, once in the century but about 11 years later the same level the same flood level happened again uh, so you, you they were uh, the same town was hit by another 100 year event okay uh, but in between uh, after the 202 flood there were actually discussion whether they should do something to it okay uh, but there is a group of citizens who feel that hmm you know, that's why, why waste money? Huh? Already happened, no? Once in one in uh, one hundred years, okay. So it's going to be happen so soon, and similarly, it happened to another town in German Germany also, right? They were talking about whether they should build a dike, you know, uh, after the the flood in two o two, and some supported it, but others say the next flood of the century won't happen for another one hundred years, okay. So no action was taken, and then they were struck again, right? So. When you use this kind of uh, phrase, like 100 year event, or the return period is 100 years, or for my, for my own research area, earthquake engineering, right? Uh, my PhD was in earthquake engineering. We talk about 500 years event, okay? In most countries that I know of, in fact, probably all the countries, the earthquake design code consider once in 500 years event, right? That means we, the, the, the level of earthquake we consider in the design has a very long return period, 500 years. So some may ask, you know, why do you want to worry something that is you no, know, it's so rare? It's because of the consequence, right? If you don't design for it, when you get that kind of uh, uh, earthquake level, then the destruction is going to be widespread. There'll be a lot of uh, deaths, there'll be a lot of buildings damaged or destroyed, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean you go to wait for 500 years or if you take the average 250 years, it's not going to happen. It can happen anytime. Okay, so it's the same thing here. But if you use this term here, right, people will not take action. They feel that it's so rare. Uh, so the choice of word is important, right? Instead of using 100 year flood, you probably it's better to say, you no, know, this has a 1% chance of happening every year. So even it happened last year, there's still 1% chance of happening, okay? this year or next year and so forth. So every year there is a 1% chance. So do you want to do something about it? Then you start to consider the consequence. If the consequence is minor, then you probably can ignore it, right? So, so it's again probability times consequence. So that's how usually experts will quantify a risk, right? Risk is defined as the product, uh, the two terms uh, of two terms, the probability of that happening, which may be very low, like this case 1%, times the consequence, which could be high. Right, so if the outcome is high, you know, then you want to do something about it. So that's expert's view. And so if you don't communicate effectively, uh, then you know you lead to the uh, wrong action or inaction, uh, like the, the flood events in Germany. Right, they didn't do anything, uh, even though they, they were hit already once. Okay, so it's important to understand how public members uh, uh, interpret your numbers. Right, how you uh, how they understand your words, you know, the choice of words, right? And then you got to help them. Uh, you got to rephrase it. You got to probably uh, try to uh, explain in a different way so that they will have a better appreciation of the risk. Then the proper action can follow. Okay, of course, this again have to come back to evidence-based research, right? Um, so it's all uh, sort of uh, linked together, right? You, you need to be able to quantify the probability you know, find the evidence, do scientific research about it, then you have to think of how pe uh, public members perceive it, if you explain this way, or maybe there's a better way to explain it, uh, so that is part of the effective risk communication. Right, so 
if your risk communication is inactive or in, uh, effective, ineffective, it may uh, lead to misguided decision making, right? Or inaction, or overreaction, right? It can be the other way around. Uh, so if the risk is actually very very low, uh, yeah, but per, uh, public members perceive it to be high, then you may allocate the resources unnecessarily to tackle something, uh, some over perceived risk, or the other way around, right? So that means you spend too much money, too much time on something. That has low risk and insufficient resources is allocated to something that is actually higher risk. Okay, so so we don't want to see that uh, the sort of the the uh, improper allocation of resource and time. But that happens, right? That happens because if you don't do it well, this is the outcome. One example of misguided public uh, public perception is very recent in Japan. There was a debate about uh, uh, the side effect of HPV. Vaccination, HPV vaccine actually is very effective uh, to reduce uh, six different types of cancers. Uh, in particular, it can prevent 70% of uh, cervical cancer and so forth. Okay, so the benefits are there. But in uh, 2016, there was a Japanese researcher who, who published a paper and claimed that he found a link between the, the use of HPV vaccine and brain damage in mice. Okay, so he did an experiment on mice. And this outcome or the results were challenged, were questioned by many scientists. And eventually the paper was retracted from a journal. But because of that one article, plus as you know these days with the social media and so forth, right, the, the information can really, or misinformation can spread very fast. It has dominated the public perception, it has changed the public perception of the vaccine, of HPV vaccine. And there was a fall, very big fall in the HPV vaccination rate in Japan from 70% to just 1%. Yeah. Okay, and actually it happens to some other countries, but Japan probably is probably uh, see the most dramatic fall. Okay, from 70% to almost zero. Okay, no thanks to that uh, one paper which was later on retracted. Another example was also quite recent, uh, that is a Typhoon Haiyan, okay, uh, in 2003, uh, yeah, 2013, sorry, 2013, uh, actually it's a super typhoon, right? So it happened on 8th of November, 2013. Uh, let me go back to, but this is the standard advisory template issued by the, the uh, National Disaster Reduction Council and so forth, right? Very long name, uh, NDRRMC. Okay, so they have this standard template and then they sort of fill in the blank, right? And at 5 p.m. on the day before the super typhoon Haiyan hits Philippines, right? They, they just do this kind of standard message. And if you, uh, I mean, very small print, so I just extract them out, right? They advise the residents in the low lying and mountainous areas against possible flats, uh, fresh floods and landslides. So this is sort of common terms, okay? It happened many times. And those living in the coastal areas are alerted against storm surge, storm searches. Storm search, no, you know, it's just some storm, some search, maybe a sea level and so forth. So, a lot of people did not take this seriously, right? And there was a paper, journal paper, uh, published uh, and draw lessons from this incident, right? And uh, some of the conclusions are just extracted here, okay? So, right, the risk communication process, you know, for that uh, typhoon uh, Haiyan fail to convey meaningful information. They just use the standard template uh, from the agency they, at which they have used many times, right? But it did not capture the attention of many people. So risk communication in that paper say that paper say needs to employ various modes of translation. If you feel that this is something serious, in fact, the prediction is this is something very, you know, uh, uh, large or super kind of uh, typhoon, but they did not not emphasize the point, they just use a standard uh, message and and that leads to very uh, uh, serious, uh, in fact, more than 6,000 people died. Okay, and in some of the pictures you can see, right, it's like a war zone, huh, according to some people on the ground. Okay, in fact, uh, there are some agencies and news outlets they, uh, that start to use the uh, more creative way to convey the message. I'm, I'm not sure whether I can play this. Let me try. Right. Uh, for example, they use a mixed reality to 
to convey the important messages about wildfire. wildfire. Too many windows. This mountainside is a prime location that provides breathtaking views, but all these trees, all this dry vegetation, unfortunately increases the fire danger. And as the climate warms, the danger is only getting worse. Now, wildfire season has become a year-long threat, burning twice the area now than in 1970. It's true that these fires, they can reinvigorate nature, but when they flare up in populated areas, they all too often lead to total destruction. Now, of course, weather plays a huge role on how explosive a wildfire can be. And over the past few decades, the climate over the western U.S. has become more conducive for wildfires with overall warmer, drier weather. Like where I am today, the overgrown brush has dried out from the lack of rain, leaving plenty of available fuel to burn. The air is hot and extremely dry with dew points in the teens with winds getting stronger. Now, believe it or not, more than 80 percent of wildfires start because of human activity. Often it's a stray ember from an unattended campfire or a tossed cigarette that can ignite Night a firestorm and it doesn't take much and can spread quickly. Now climate trends warn that these fires will continue to be more intense and burn longer than just a few decades ago. Now the smoke itself is hot and races high into the sky becoming visible for a mile. So let's get above that smoke for a better view. Unfortunately the strong winds are really giving these flames life. In fact by the looks of it this fire is spreading at ludicrous speed and becoming an unstoppable firestorm. Fires like this one can consume up to a football field every second, just like the Thomas fire did in December of 2017. And since heat rises, fires travel faster as they move uphill. Wind can also push embers downwind and start new fires. This is known as spotting putting homes on the mountainside in great danger. Wildfires can turn forest floors and even neighborhoods into nearly unstoppable raging infernos with temperatures reaching over 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Winds carry the thick smoke for miles, turning day into night and making it difficult to breathe. If you live in a wildfire prone area, be sure you and your family have a plan of action. Residents could have a few hours to only a few minutes to escape to safety. Now, hopefully your neighborhood will never be in the path of a wildfire like this one, but the frequency and size of the extreme fire disasters has increased as the average temperature rises. And scenes like this, uh, could become a frightening new reality. Okay, yeah, I think this is uh, something very uh, relevant actually. In fact, I think just last week the heat wave has caused wildfire in Spain, right? Uh, and just last year, I think in Northern California, there were many uh, wildfires and it happened in China, it happened in Australia. Okay, so, uh, but often the residents uh, did not get the message uh, in the in the meaningful way. They think uh, that they are more lucky than others. Uh, it's not going to come to my my uh, my resident area and so forth. But by the time they realize it, sometimes it's too late uh, to to evacuate. Uh, there are horror examples that they have to abandon the car and jump to a pool or a pond, right? Uh, just, just to just to stay alive. Okay, let me go back to the PowerPoint. Where was I? Okay. So another example of uh, risk communication is is uh, in earthquake, right? Very close to my heart. In fact, uh, in uh, 2009, anybody from Italy, right? In Central Italy, there was earthquake, not very big, but it killed like, like uh, about 300 people. And before the earthquake of uh, this magnitude, 5.9 happened, there were already some tremors. Okay, sort of warning, right? So people were concerned, and and uh, there was this uh, national commission uh, comprising uh, several scientists and engineers, and and one government official. And after the meeting, they sent a message out. One of them said that uh, one of them said that uh, a large earthquake along the lines of a. Uh, 1703, you now there was a big earthquake in 1703, is improbable, right, in the short term. Okay, maybe the, the judgment was not correct, but they use the word improbable. They also, in the uh, same uh, statement, uh, it says that the possibility cannot be definitely be uh, excluded. Okay, 
but people probably won't see the whole paragraph. They say improbable. Improbable means impossible. Okay, they probably equate this to right, which is not true. It's just the probability of that happening is very low. You no, know, it's a very very low low probability event. Like I mentioned, earthquake design consider five hundred years. That means every year there's a zero point two percent chance of that happening. Zero point two percent chance. So if you convert that to next week, it's even smaller, right? But it can still happen. Okay. As a result, they were charged and they were found guilty. And each of these seven uh, people in the National Commission was sentenced to six years prison. Okay, can you imagine that scientists get jailed huh, for, for, for uh, no, uh, sharing uh, their findings or their prediction? But this prediction is probabilistic, right? It's never exact. And they appeal. Fortunately, uh, upon the appeal, the six scientists were acquitted. But the government official was still found guilty. The sentence was reduced. But the guilty, uh, the, the sentence was reduced to something like men's, men's, uh, manslaughter or something, right? Involuntary manslaughter for negligence and imprudence in making a series of reassuring comments. Okay, so you can actually get, get sued if you, if you are not careful, right? Or get charged, no? Uh, for not communicating the risk in the proper way. Right? You, you don't want to be too reassuring that it's not going to happen. Okay? Uh, or even when you use the word improbable, all right, you probably explain it in the better term. Uh, okay. So this all has to do with the way we think, right? The way human thinks, our brains work. So there are two modes of thinking. One is the fast thinking. Fast thinking is based on experience, right? Based on uh, usually some feelings, uh, usually, you know, very intuitive, not very quantitative, you know, not analytical. And the other part of our brain does this kind of a slow thinking? Okay, feelings can be, uh, you know, fear, right? Uh, or, or sometimes can be uh, unfounded fear. Okay, distrust, you know, in in the authority, anger because it affects me or my family. Okay, or ignorance can be on the other side, you know, just you know, you just ignore the, the real risk uh, and so forth. Okay, the other kind of thinking we have is more analytical. Right, we can do it, but it's it's a solo process, right? We will do the quantitative uh, calculation. We will do the logical thinking, and we tend to present them in uh, numbers, uh, charts, and so forth. And we we you know so this actually is what normally experts will do, right? We do scientific research, right? We analyze the data, we present them in, in certain uh, statistical way. Okay, but that's not what a normal person would think, right? They would tend to use the experiential uh, judgment uh, to assess the risk. So there are these uh, mental and effect of feeling factors of risk perception. So it depends. So uh, irrespective of what the expert says, what the scientific evidence show, they will have their own way of a risk assessment. Okay, some are considered less risky because it's my choice. Okay, I control like driving a car, right? In fact, the probability of getting killed in a car accident is much higher than getting killed in a car, uh, air, uh, airplane crash. But people think that you no, know, it's more risky to take airplane uh, because I'm not the one who fly the, the airplane, right? No, I'm not in control, you know, and I'm not so familiar with how exactly the airplane uh, works and so forth. So many of these uh, will influence the way we perceive risk. Okay, similarly, right, uh, if you go to swim, go to the beach to swim, uh, the, the, the chance of uh, getting eaten up by shark is much, much less than getting struck by lightning. Okay, but lightning is a natural event, you know, so you probably take it as okay, and the consequence, you know, people don't, don't you know, uh, you don't want to suffer a painful death, you know? so the kind of uh, emotional, uh, picture comes in, right? so you think it's more risky swimming in the beach uh, and, and get killed by a shark than you know, uh, uh, walking the rain, uh, uh, thunderstorm well, without taking precaution and get killed, get, get killed by uh, uh, get hit by a lightning. Right? So there are many such uh, factors uh, that influence how we perceive risk. So this is something that we have to face it. Right? These are realities. Uh, you, you cannot ignore it. Right? You cannot just present facts and figures and hope that the public members would you know, accept it huh? because all these emotions come in. 
So really, the experts' view of and the public members' perception of risk are quite different, right? As I mentioned, right, the one one common way to define risk is the the product of probability and consequence. Okay, it's a low probability but high consequence. I, I should worry about it. If it's high probability, low consequence, I also have to worry about it, right? If it's high probability and high consequence, that's that ter that's terrible. Okay, but low probability, low consequence, you can ignore it. Okay, so this is how we want to uh, quantify the risk. Okay, in fact, in NUS and I'm sure in many universities, we have this risk assessment uh, for laboratory work and so forth, right? Even for office work. Huh? So every principal investigator, when they undertake a research project, he has to be certified that he has gone through the risk assessment. He has taken the necessary uh, steps, no. To minimize the risk and this is how we use probability likelihood okay times consequence right so we have to evaluate is it low or high in in both uh, factors but a lay person's perspective of risk is different it's hazard plus outrage hazard refers to the source so you look at the source right like the shark or, or, or airplane or, or, or chemical plant you know, near my house that will cause uh, maybe air pollution or water Pollution. In fact, very recently in, in, in our neighbor, Johor, right, there was this uh, case of uh, school children falling sick because mm -hmm. they, they, think, uh, they, they, they felt that the air is, has, been, uh, it has contained certain substance, but the authorities say it's okay, you know, based on our measurement, monitoring and so forth, it's okay, right? Uh, so, so you focus on the source, they think it's some chemical plants that is causing all this pollution. Outrage is uh, your emotion again, right? You feel angry because it affects me or affects my children, especially. Okay, so all this comes in. Uh, so it's so some quantified risk from a uh, lay person's perspective is simply risk is equal to hazard, you no, know, plus outrage. Okay, and this can be influenced by headlines, news, or social media, right? If you, a lot of people talk about certain things. Okay, especially something dramatic, uh, something unusual happen, then people will tend to overestimate the risk. Okay, me, uh, me, me overestimate the risk. Uh, so there is also this uh, 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 phrase called availability cascade. That means more and more people, more and more people will start to share their own experience uh, because some discussion is going on in the news, social media, and so forth. There will be a lot of people who start to add their own uh, uh, experiences, and then the public fear increases. Right. On the other hand, it can switch to the other way around. Right. Uh, it's called an evaluative bias. Okay. Uh, when the media attention switches to something else, right, then suddenly uh, that risk is sort of disappear or become uh, something not important. So you can lead to underestimation of risk when mass media has something else to focus on. Right. So you're sort of like fighting for attention. Okay. So in research for risk communication, which involves uh, understanding how people actually perceive risk, how people uh, make uh, decisions, right? Uh, so this is step number one. You have to understand how people, how public members understand risk. Okay, that's why our institute is called a public understanding of risk. Right? That's the first step, very important. And then. What do people already know, right? Uh, how, how do they make the, decision, uh, the decisions? And what else do they need to know? Then you, obviously, there, there are often gaps you know, between public perception of risk and the real risk, uh, the real risk as, as uh, quantified or researched by uh, experts. Okay, so then when there's a gap, right, you have to find out what is this gap. Okay, what, what else do they need to know so that they can be, be, make uh, better decisions? And of course, you need a feedback loop, right? So you do the proper or effective risk communication, you have to measure it. Uh, that's the toughest part, right? How do you evaluate, right? How do you know before and after your effort in risk communication? Okay, but you want to be able to know whether it is effective. Uh, so you need some uh, uh, ways to like survey you know, random, randomized control trials or some other tests uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of your risk communication. Uh, so this is called a mental models approach. This is not something new. It has been, you know, you can actually find books and papers on this. Okay, but these are the essential steps for effective risk communication.
Okay, so that's where our institute is about. I, I shared some of this before, but I just for completeness, uh, so we have already the mission, a vision and mission and our strong belief, right, that if we can make uh, public members understand the risk better, then, you know, the decision making will be uh, more objective and that will lead to a better and safer society. And currently, our institute will focus on three uh, main areas, data and technology, uh, technology refers to mainly the e uh, emerging and new technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous vehicles, robots, and uh, blockchain, right? Now, Bitcoin, all this stuff. Okay, so many uh, drones. In fact, uh, recently our Changi Airport, uh, which is one one of the best airports in the world, right? Uh, by ranking, had uh, several disruption due to somebody flying a drone near the airport. Uh, so you have to cancel flights, they have to change. Some of the flights are actually diverted to Johor. Okay, uh, So it's as serious as that. Just one unknown drone flying around, right, they have to take a lot of action. So there's risk involved. You know, that you worry about the, the, uh, some, some accidents. Huh? So that's one area. Environment and climate. Okay, uh, uh, It's another area. Okay, uh, Some of these examples are already illustrated. Right. Climate change in particular, uh, global warming effect. Okay, in fact, uh, um, the evidence uh, there are many evidences and and uh, statistics uh, that shows that on the whole we we are trending upward uh, the, in terms of the uh, rise in temperature and uh, increase in uh, CO two and so forth. Okay, but I, in my own opinion, I think many people are not taking enough action. I mean, many countries. Okay. Uh, so, I, okay, I think I better skip some of these things. Health and food safety is an outer area, but all these will require many other disciplines. And the communication, computer science, right? We work with the School of Computing here, okay? Uh, we have to work with uh, behavior scientists and uh, psychologists and so forth. Okay, uh, let me see my time. Eh? Okay, we are running out of time. I have a video to show you. Maybe I do it. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a video about our uh, institute, right? Uh, maybe I'll see the time. I, I let uh, Prof. Bala do it first. If we have time, I will show you a three-minute video, okay? Uh, but this is a very uh, heavy uh, slide to show what we are doing uh, in this institute. Somebody is trying to call me. Uh, something risky happened. <laughs> okay, so this is just uh, like commercial, right? Uh, if you want to understand risk, okay, we are going to uh, co-host uh, uh, this uh, forum called Understanding Risk Forum next year, right, uh, May, in Singapore, okay? And uh, yeah, you can check the website here or just talk to us. Uh, we have some brochures to give away. Uh, so this is a big com uh, conference, big forum. Uh, we as uh, Normally, it has about 1,000 participants. So this is the first time this forum is held in Asia, right? Uh, the last four, uh, this is the fifth one, every two years, uh, the last four were held outside Asia. Okay, so I should hand over to my colleague, uh, Professor Bala, uh, to continue my talk here. All right, good afternoon. I know what you are thinking. I'm coming between you and your lunch. So I will try to keep you entertained for the next 20 minutes. Um, so basically, my talk is going to build on the previous presentations by professors uh, Kivil and Co. And uh, so uh, we heard so much about nanotechnology and basically the field of nanotechnology has undergone unprecedented growth the last decade. So much so that it's uh, categorized as a multi-billion dollar industry. And of course there are a lot of practical benefits that you could identify from uh, nanotechnology which may get carried away. But at the same time, uh, we, we are less concerned about the so-called implications of nanotechnology. So in particular, we are talking about there are some concerns uh, associated with potential environmental health and safety risk of exposure to nanoparticles or nanomaterials. So there are some knowns and unknowns uh, in terms of uh, toxicity, ecotoxicity, and long-term accumulation effects of uh, nanomaterials. So speaking of unknowns, there are some known unknowns and unknown unknowns. So what I would like to do now is to make some unknowns known to you in this talk. 
Um, well, there are some famous quotes about uh, nanotechnology, which I'm sure you are quite familiar with. But basically, nanotechnology, as you know, is highly versatile. At the same time, the impact of nanotechnology on the health, wealth, and lives of people is tremendous, as mentioned by uh, the late uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, Richard Smalley. Uh, again, uh, in terms of uh, nanoparticles, there was a question behind as to how to categorize nanoparticles. So nanoparticles or nanomaterials are characterized usually in terms of their size. And we are talking about materials that have a diameter less than 100 uh, nanometers. And nanotechnology is basically it's, it's a science of manipulating particles in the nanoscale in such a way that they will have uh, exciting magnetic, electrical, electronic, and chemical properties. So they could be used for a diverse, uh, diverse applications. But having said that, as you can see here, uh, nanomaterials come in different sizes, shapes, surface areas, and also chemical composition. As a result, they also have different toxicity associated with them. So there are some thought-provoking questions for us to ponder over. Uh, for example, uh, who is at risk? Uh, would that be workers in the production area? So we are talking about occupational exposure. Or would that be people using nano enable products, we are talking about consumers, or are we concerned about exposure of ecosystems? So basically, this is like a, a quick summary of the group discussion we had uh, just before the break. Uh, the key question to ask is how to assess nano environmental health and safety risk reliably so that we could you know, communicate risk associated to the public at large with no uncertain terms as pointed out by Professor Ko earlier. Um, now, there are some common characteristics of nanoparticles. Uh, for example, they all have a very high surface area and uh, the chemical reactivity of nanoparticles is uh, very high. And the, as a result, uh, the small size of particles, uh, they could be easily taken up uh, by human uh, cellular systems. And they also have a tendency to agglomerate, especially under favorable conditions. At the same time, nanoparticles or materials could also be highly persistent, uh, inducing long-term accumulation effects, especially in ecosystems. Um, now, so we, we seldom realize that uh, we are using a range of uh, consumer products uh, in our day-to-day -day life especially in the home environment. And as you can see here, we have a variety of synthetic products, many of which are made of nanomaterials. So we are constantly exposed to such nanomaterials uh, in our day-to-day -day life. And the question to raise here is how do we characterize the nano risk? Again, as pointed out by Professor Ko earlier, a nano risk is nothing but the probability of developing negative consequences of exposure to nanomaterials and, uh, and so on. And we will figure out as to how we could come up with a number that will give us sort of a, an idea as to how high or how low the risk would be. Now, what are the modes of exposure to nanomaterials, uh, especially in the natural environment? And again, uh, Professor Kivil has uh, pointed out earlier that we have a variety of nanomaterials that are biodistributed uh, among different ecosystems we have, uh, including air, water, and food products, and soil. So we are constantly exposed to nanomaterials that are rising from all this multimedia that we have in the environment. But uh, usually we think that the negative consequences of exposure to nanoparticles will be restricted to exposed to individuals. But what is quite alarming is to realize that such problems are actually transmitted to others, you know, to innocent victims. So basically, it becomes more like an intergenerational problem. So this is something we have to keep in mind in, in the context of doing risk assessment. And at the same time, nanomaterials could be uh, uh, could get into the human body through various pathways, including inhalation to the air pathway or ingestion through food or through water or through injection uh, mode. Finally, 
uh, he could kind of accumulate within the human organs, especially when we are exposed to such materials over, over a prolonged period of time. And speaking of inhalation, as you can see uh, in this cartoon, uh, particles of different sizes are deposited in different uh, parts of the respiratory system. So to be specific, the larger particles are retained, especially in the nose or in the upper respiratory system. And basically our tendency here is to cough out or sneeze out such large particles that are retained in the upper respiratory system. On the other hand, nanoparticles being extremely small in the nanometer range, uh, they are quite similar to air molecules, which got 10 to the power of minus 10 meters, get 10 to the power of minus 9 meters for the case of nanoparticles. So as a result, as you can see here, nanoparticles continue to travel along the air pathway. Eventually, they can be deposited in the alveolar region. So then the question here is how much of retention of nanoparticles could occur, especially the lower respiratory region. And the uh, and retention here is the difference between the deposition of particles and excretion or clearance. So when particles are deposited in the alveoli region, there's very really little room for excretion or clearance of particles. As a result, the accumulation of nanoparticles in the lower respiratory region are pretty high. So which becomes very evident if you look at this uh, uh, animation. And as you can see here, we come, when you continue to inhale and nanoparticles, they will continue to be deposited in the alveolite region. As a result of the large retention of nanoparticles, it must so happen that the toxic materials contained in nanoparticles could be uh, transferred to the bloodstream and the blood will biodistribute such toxic materials among different organs of the human body, including the brain, inducing neurological diseases, including autism. So there are a number of uh, health-related problems that we could uh, experience as a result of exposure to nanoparticles or materials uh, that, that we have, uh, that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So apart from human health effects, we should be equally concerned about what's happening in the natural environment. And again, as pointed out by Professor Kivil earlier, and uh, so we have either accidental or incidental discharge of uh, nanomaterials uh, into the natural environment, especially in the aquatic environment. So as you can see here, the nanomaterials tend to bioaccumulate in the fat tissues of exposed uh, animals or uh, aquatic organisms. But then again, as it's happening in the case of humans, so these uh, materials are not restricted to the exposed uh, uh, aquatic organisms. Instead, they could be transferred across trophic levels, so much so that bioaccumulation of nanomaterial in specific animals could eventually become biomagnification, being transferred to larger organisms. So in, especially when we consume such uh, organisms or animals, it could get into the even, eventually human body. That's the additional pathway through which nanomaterials can get into the human body apart from direct inhalation or ingestion and so on. Okay, so having said that, how do you really quantify the risk associated with exposure to nanomaterials? Uh, again, uh, the key term, the key uh, concept here is the uh, risk assessment or risk analysis, which basically refers to the quantitative and qualitative evaluation of the risk uh, post to exposed, uh, exposed uh, individuals, could be uh, humans or uh, uh, ecosystems and so on. So we have to come up with a very systematic approach in order to be able to quantify the actual risk involved due to exposure to nanomaterials. So that involves at least three steps, as you can see here. The key question to ask would be, so what is the hazard that we are talking about? What's the source of nanomaterials that's of concern to us? And then what's the probability of risk involved? So is it 0 0.9 or 0 0.1? If the probability is very low, exposure is inconsequential. If the probability is very high, close to one, the exposure to nanomaterials is highly consequential. And then, so what, what are the consequences of risk over here? Would there be short-term health effects or long-term health effects? Could be, for example, cancer or could be inflammation. It's something we got to figure out. 
And then once we do this quantified risk analysis, then we had to come up with a mitigation approach as to how we could possibly mitigate our exposure to harmful nanomaterials. So for that, we had to do the comparative risk analysis. So what do I mean by that? Even in the absence of engineered nanomaterials, you are exposed to natural nanoparticles. So for example, and we, you might go walking or cycling uh, as you would prefer the active mode of transport in a city rather than doing a passive mode of transport involving motorized uh, modes of transportation. So if you do that, you will realize that you are exposed to sudden burst of particles coming from the diesel truck or the diesel a bus and so on. So this is something that's going to induce exposure to nanoparticles coming from the use of diesel uh, in automobiles. Or as a religious practice, we might burn some incense sticks, which is still happening in different parts of the world. So when that happens, we are exposed to nanoparticles emitted from incense burning. So the question to ask here is what's the, what's the exposure to engineered nanomaterials as compared to nanoparticles coming from elsewhere in the uh, religious, as part of uh, religious practices and so on. So based on this comparative risk analysis, we could figure out whether the risk associated with exposure to engineered nanomaterials is acceptable or unacceptable. So then we have to do the risk reduction in terms of intervention are identifying certain uh, uh, mitigation methods and then we got to figure out as to what kind of financial commitment we have to make in order to achieve the practical benefits that we are, le that we are looking for through mitigation or reduction of exposure mm -hmm. to nanomaterials. So having said that, the risk assessment is indeed a very comprehensive approach because it cuts across a different environmental media so starting from the hazard, the source that we identified, then we had to go across the entire ecosystem we have. And then more importantly, we got to quantify the emission of nanoparticles from a particular source. So it could be uh, in a particular industry, or it could be a bunch of industries, indoors or outdoors, and so on and so forth. And finally, we have to consider exposure events in terms of duration of exposure, place of exposure, time of exposure and the serious uh, severity of exposure. So that based on which we could sort of uh, estimate the uptake of nanomaterials, which is nothing but the dose that's ingested or inhaled by, human, by humans. And then we had to consider biokinetics that basically responsible for the biotransformation of nanomaterials that get into the human body and which will eventually lead to the toxicity, toxicity assessment and based on which we could actually quantify the actual risk involved due to exposure to nanomaterials. <coughs> so now in terms of uh, doing this uh, toxicity assessment, uh, there are two ways we can do it, uh, either in vitro or the in vivo kind of toxicity assessment. Let me tell you a little bit about it. About it. In terms of in vitro toxicity assessment, we are talking about having a controlled environment so where we have something like epithelial cell lines, uh, which are exposed to suspected nanomaterials, uh, which, are, which could be toxic. So then we could sort of assess the cell viability, cell death, metabolically active cells. And in addition, we could also consider oxidative stress, which basically induces inflammation among exposed to individuals. So based on which we could figure out whether the nanomaterials that are suspected to be harmful or indeed harmful, are not so, so much harmful and so on. Just to give a quick example, uh, gold nanoparticles are usually considered to be toxic. So we have done an assess assessment, uh, in vitro toxicity assessment. Uh, the hypothesis we have made is the toxicity of gold nanoparticles would depend on the way nanoparticles are prepared. So we could prepare gold nanoparticles using chemical synthesis or biological synthesis. So we consider both options over here. And it turns out that the biosynthesized gold nanoparticles are much less toxic as compared to chemically synthesized nanoparticles. And the reason is that when you do the chemical synthesis of nanoparticles, we happen to use a lot of uh, harmful chemical reagents in the course of synthesis, uh, which would sort of be attached to nanoparticles inducing unknown toxicity. On the other hand, if you do the biosynthesis, 
So something like uh, phenolic acids that would come from biomaterials will provide protective coating onto nanoparticles, onto nanoparticles which will hinder or suppress the toxicity of uh, nanoparticles. Again, so we cannot sort of say that go, all gold nanoparticles are toxic. That would depend on the way gold nanoparticles are prepared. So this is what we get proved with in vitro uh, toxicity assessment. To complement the efforts, we have also done in vivo toxicity assessment over here. Uh, in this uh, scenario, we have considered different types of nanoparticles, uh, including silver nanoparticles and titanium dioxide nanoparticles. So when we do the in vitro or in vivo toxicity assessment, we usually consider only one type of particles, nanoparticles in isolation. But in reality, we are exposed to more than one type of nanoparticles. So it's very important to con consider the binary uh, composition of nanoparticles. So that's the reason why we have used a combination of silver and titanium dioxide nanoparticles at the same time. Having said that, in natural ecosystems, we also have diverse other contaminants. For example, nitrate, phosphate, trace elements, and so on. So all these contaminants that we have in the aquatic environment could, again, could either enhance the toxicity of nanoparticles or they could suppress the toxicity of nanoparticles. So we are talking about either synergistic or antagonistic health effects associated with the naturally present contaminants in the environment. So we have done this study uh, drawing water from the natural environment with their own composition and we've done the toxicity assessment using uh, uh, fish, uh, zebra fish embryos. And it turns out that some contaminants we have in water bodies suppress the toxicity of these two nanoparticles. There are other contaminants that tend to enhance the toxicity of nanoparticles. Again, we cannot come up with a conclusive proof unless we do this toxicity assessment uh, using animal models as we have done over here. So the key consideration is the dose. When we're speaking of dose, we have to consider environmentally relevant concentration of nanomaterials. So sometimes we use excessively large concentration of nanomaterials based on the study design. If, if, if that's the case, so then the conclusions we draw may not be realistic. So it's absolutely important for us to ensure that the concentration of the nanomaterials we consider either for in vitro or in vivo, in vivo uh, a toxicity assessment would be relevant to the actual environment where we are. It could be occupational or the natural environment. So once we get the results from the exposure assessment, especially the dose response relationship, we could extrapolate the results we get to other possible scenarios which is something again Professor Kivil mentioned in his talk. So that would involve the consideration of metabolism and the detoxification, accumulation and excretion of particles. So there are a bunch of models that are mathematical models that are available in terms of assessing the uh, health risk uh, that's of relevance to the, the entire population in a city. So this is what we are talking about in terms of extrapolating the results we get from in vitro, in vivo toxicity assessment to the entire population, which could be at risk over here. So now in terms of risk analysis, uh, it, it's not just sufficient to do the risk assessment as I just described to you. It's more important for us to do the life cycle assessment. And again, going back to the talk we had this morning, and we were uh, concerned about exposure to silver nanoparticles. So you may realize uh, that you may, you may not realize that the socks we wear contain uh, silver nanoparticles because the silver nanoparticles act as more like a biocide. So the, you know, if you don't have the proper socks, of course, it becomes very odorous. But then if we have the socks containing silver nanoparticles, we suppress the water because they act as a biocide. Having said that, after you use the socks, you want to put it out for washing in a washing machine and so on, then the silver nanoparticles are released, they're leached uh, into the water body. And then the water now is being discharged from the residential sector, would enter the wastewater treatment plant, eventually lakes, streams, and water bodies, other water bodies. So again, it could be transmitted. The nanoparticles could be transmitted to other uh, aquatic media 
apart from where they are generated. So in this context, it's increasingly important for us to do the life cycle assessment. So speaking of life cycle assessment, we go all the way from the cradle to grave, from the beginning to the end. So the question here is where are the silver particles, nanoparticles coming from? How are they actually made? So we are talking about extraction of the mineral words, then uh, making, take, make, break, and throw. So all these steps have to be considered in the assessment of a toxicity of nanoparticles. So the bottom line here, if we can combine the life cycle assessment with risk analysis, we get a holistic picture in terms of potential health impacts of nanoparticles. And apart from that, these days, we are also concerned about climate change. So if you are going to be using a washing machine, how much electricity is being consumed, how much CO2 is emitted, everything has to be accounted for. So we don't want to consider nanoparticles in isolation uh, over here. So, and in terms of uh, exposure assessment, uh, what is uh, ignored most of the time is the occupational exposure assessment, uh, which is very important in the life cycle assessment. So this is where you would have maximum exposure to nanomaterials right at the point of manufacturing. So the key question to ask is, do we have occupational exposure limits at this point in time? Unfortunately not, and partly because of the difficulty involved in exposure assessment. And we don't have reliable sensors or devices that could be deployed in a number of industries that are involved with the production of nanoparticles. So this is something to consider as we go along. And once we do that, then we do the risk management. In the risk management, we had to come up with a hierarchy of mitigation options that could be deployed in order to reduce the exposure of uh, occupants or workforce in a particular industry. And so again, giving two examples over here, which again were highlighted by Professor Kivil in his talk. So one is like a use of glove box for containment, especially when you prepare sort of nanomaterials in the lab environment. When you do it on a large scale, in this case, nano carbon nanotubes, and we want to make sure the carbon nanotubes are produced in a more enclosed furnaces so that there is no accidental emission of carbon nanotubes into the occupational environment. And speaking of risk control, this is a hierarchy to follow. I don't want to go into the details. A picture is worth a thousand words, so you can figure out what the hierarchy is. And perception is very different from reality. So most of the time we think that the risk involved is low or high. So that's a perception. But unless we do the risk assessment, uh, either with the toxicity in vitro, in vivo, we will not know the real risk involved, actual risk involved. To give an example, uh, CFCs. So when CFCs were introduced by the company DuPont, you know, several decades ago, CFCs were considered to be environmentally benign because CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, are considered to be uh, uh, harmless, non-toxic, and not soluble in water. What goes up does not come down and not flammable. So there is no explosion. So the CFCs were introduced you know, and, uh, go, you know, in, into the uh, environment uh, without thinking as to what could happen to CFCs in the long term. Now, you know, it's the history. CFCs get into the stratosphere, destroy the good ozone. Okay, so the lesson we have learned is like the actual risk is to be quantified. We cannot drive, we cannot guide ourselves by the perceived risk which could be misleading. And so to give an example again, the conventional approach when it comes to contaminants in the environment, including nanomaterials, is you are innocent until proven guilty. So that kind of philosophy unfortunately cannot be applicable to nanomaterials because it is a reactive approach. We are waiting for a problem to occur, like the CFCs. Then we come up with a Montreal protocol to solve the problem. And thank God we were able to solve it because we were able to find substitutes for CFCs. What about climate change? There are no substitutes. There are 7.6 billion uh, guilty parties. All of us are equally responsible because of the lifestyle we adopt. So are there any replacements for carbon dioxide unless we switch to renewable uh, fuel? A renewable uh, electricity mode of production. So the precautionary principle, the preventive approach is the key to go forward. So once we realize that there is a, again 0.1% risk involved in terms of high earthquake, 
do something about it. Don't tell yourself the number is, you know, negligible. So that's the bottom line over here. So speaking of risk estimation, there are two important factors to consider, technology reliability and human reliability. We can come up with an absolutely safe nanotechnology. Nothing would happen to every human. So who is going to push the button? It will be humans. So if by any chance you push a wrong button, everything is going to fall apart. It's going to be a fiasco. And this has happened in many places, including the Bhopal tragedy that happened in India and in, in, the, in the company. Again, the lack of uh, inspection and maintenance. So likewise, it's very important to make sure the workforce involved in nanotechnology industry is well trained. At the same time, we have to have periodic inspection and maintenance as part of the routine protocol just to ensure that there are no accidents whatsoever that are uh, that will be uh, that will happen so uh, risk evaluation and risk communication i don't have to tell much about it this final word about what's going on so we are increasingly concerned about exposure to nanomaterials you can see the increase the number of research articles review articles published in the open literature over the last decade or so now you could see there's a sporadic increase the number of research articles published, especially the last six, seven years. And now we have about 1,400 papers being published uh, almost every year. But then if you look at the exposure groups over here, it's sort of interesting. There are five exposure groups that are identified. But most of the time, the research articles are focused on the general public. Okay, And we are kind of uh, conveniently ignore the occupational environment. For some reasons, we were concerned about consumers in 2007 and 8, but then it declined afterwards. So does it mean that there were some concerns about personal care products that were used in 2007 and 8, or skin care products that introduced some problems that were not anticipated, or alternatively, the exposure groups, consumer groups are merged with the general population, and therefore we can increase the number of publications we don't know yet. But this is the current status in terms of knowledge generation and dissemination, more is to be done. And the final word here, uh, it all boils down to benefits and costs in the case of nanotechnology. So we want to make sure that the benefits outweigh the cost involved. Now, when, I, when you have a company, techno, uh, 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 nanotechnology company, uh, addressing safety concerns, there are two options to consider. The first option here is you are driven by the criterion one, which is profit. So most of the companies will try to make as much profit as possible without uh, making any investment in safety related issues. So this is option A, as you could see over here. And option B is just the opposite. So we are increasingly more concerned about safety associated with production of nanomaterials but the profit is going to fall apart, it's going to fall down, which is not good either. So what we are looking for would be optimal trade-off solutions. So for which we have to follow this profile over here so that we still get benefits and the costs are minimized over here. So that's a way to go forward in terms of communicating the risk to industry, so to say. And here I am. Thank you. Every day, we make numerous decisions. Some are quick, others involve thinking about complex trade-offs involving an uncertain future. These choices are influenced by many factors, including perceptions of risk. Do these perceptions arise from instinct, hearsay, past experience, or scientific evidence? How does our understanding of risk affect the decisions we take?
at Lloyd's Register Foundation Institute for the Public Understanding of Risk. We aim to transform the risk communication landscape in Asia through research and outreach. Established with funding from Lloyd's Register Foundation and the National University of Singapore, we work with a network of experts across disciplines, government and private organizations to maximize the impact of our research. Our multidisciplinary research team investigates what people are worried about, how this is changing over time and across countries, where the gaps are between the public's understanding of risk and the assessment of sector experts, which interventions can help to bridge these gaps. Our current research efforts focus on three areas, data and technology, environment and climate, and health and food safety. In data, the Risk Pulse project trawls through social and traditional media to identify what people are currently concerned about. We are also collaborating with Gallup on another project to analyze perceived risks across 160 countries and use big data analytics to understand the changing perception of risks. In technology, the Institute targets at risk communication of artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, and cybersecurity. In environment and climate, we partner with government agencies and international organizations to design and test communication strategies on flood and water supply risks. In the area of health, our team is examining public concerns surrounding vaccination and nutrition choices. How will our research create real-world impact? Through collaborative projects with decision makers to design and test risk communications, through education, in the classroom and online, through conferences and seminars for practitioners and public members. As an information portal, the Institute will act as a trusted independent voice on a range of risk issues. Risk affects everyone and influences many of our decisions, from whether to wear a safety helmet to how to prepare for a changing climate. We believe that understanding risk will help people and policymakers make better choices and collectively lead to a safer world. Lloyd's Register Foundation Institute for the Public Understanding of Risk. Embracing Risk, Improving Lives. So, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Thank you so much. Again, both. Yeah, thank you very much.